Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and on this very special day, not the second Monday of the month, but on a special day, because we could not have Carl Gallops with us on the second Monday of this month, we have booked him at this special time to talk about a freestyle conversation that's kind of refers back to his book, The Gods of Ground Zero and the Truth of Eden's Iniquity, Why It Still Matters and the Mystery Surrounding What's Coming Next. But he is the best-selling author of Gods and Thrones, Nahash, Forgotten Prophecy and the Return of the Elohim, When the Lion Roars, Understand the Implications of Ancient Prophecies of Our Time. And uh, I'm going to uh, just kind of go out there on a limb and say, and the upcoming new release on the investigative report and the stunning revelations of a book of the Rabbi Kaduri, uh, the famous rabbi in Israel who declared that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, Carl is the senior pastor of Hickory Hammock Baptist Church in Milton, Florida since 1987. He's an Amazon's top 60 best-selling author, conservative talk radio host, heard nationally and internationally since 2002, prolific TV, radio, print media, media guest commentator, former decorated Florida law enforcement officer, the founder of the Internet PNN News and Ministry Network at www.ppsimmons.com, and a member of the Board of Regents at the University of Mobile in Mobile, Alabama. He's seen regularly here on the second Monday of every month at 12 o'clock. He is my dear friend. He is my ministry partner. He yes. is my confidant. He is my freestyler. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> he is the one that allows me to come to him with uh, the things that keep me up at night. And I can send him an email and a text message and say, hey, have you ever asked yourself this question? And the response was great was, no, I hadn't <laughs> asked myself that question. And now that you bring it up, um, I want to talk about it. And so that's what uh, I want to talk about today. First of all, Gods of Ground Zero, an incredible, incredible read, <clears throat> confirms everything that I've always believed about the Garden of Eden, its location, uh, what God's promises are, and how uh, God is going to restore us back to that garden and that uh, he didn't move it. Uh, the relocation, the transplanting of the tree of life is nowhere to be found in the Bible. But in this Garden of Eden experience was a prophecy, Genesis 3.15. And our entire theology about the Messiah was birthed in this prophecy. And yes. we as Christendom have for 2,000 years taken this promised seed of the woman and declared it is Jesus. And we can watch throughout the entirety of Scripture how God cleared a path for the seed of the Messiah, the promised seed of the woman, to be protected, to pass through Sarah, to pass through Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, through the lineage of David, all the way to both the line of Jesus and the line of Mary, both coming and meeting at David, that being the pivotal point in the genealogy. It's fascinating who he used and how he used it. And we have spent 2,000 years talking about the promised seed of the woman. But there's another half of the story, and that is that there'll be enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And we say, oh, that's the Antichrist and we just drop it right there and we stop all discussions and we keep running down this path of Jesus. And so, as you know, I've been teaching this class, Revealing the Bible, verse by verse, <clears throat> expository, deep Hebrew and English. Um, we're 36 weeks into this teaching and I'm in Genesis 17. So you can imagine how deep this is going in both the Hebrew and English. And so as I came to the passages about Hagar, God spoke about Hagar's seed. Now, 
there's only four prophetic names of people given in Scripture. That means that God named them before they were born. Ishmael was the first. Isaac was the second. John the Baptist was the third. And Jesus was the fourth. Those were prophetically named individuals by God. Ishmael being the first one. And then God spoke about the seed of Hagar. The only other woman that he speaks of the seed of is the seed of the woman in Genesis 3.15, and then he connects that to the seed of Sarah, who is the seed of Hagar. Why is the seed of Hagar mentioned? We know it is Ishmael. That is what the lineage begins. And is this in some way insightful into us being able to now have an investigative path to examine the seed of the serpent. We have all this evidence and all this theology skewed toward the seed of the woman, but we have disparate conversations about being able to link through Scripture we know that uh, the Edomites are somehow involved, the Moabites are somehow involved, and the Ishmaelites are somehow involved. And is there some connection between them? And is there something we're seeing, something we're missing? And you're one of the few people that I can ha throw this out there with and say, hey, if it all began, if prophecy, authentic prophecy, not the false prophecy of the lie of the serpent of Nahash, in the garden, but the true prophecy of God that sets in motion the promised Messiah and the ensuing battle that we're all looking forward to. What about the investigation of the seed of Hagar? And why is it even mentioned? Because no other woman's seed is mentioned other than Sarah's, and we know that that is the promised seed. Help me here. Yes. Oh, okay. You're okay. All right. You're asking me. Yeah. No, listen, uh, Rabbi Eric, first of all, thank you for your gracious introduction. Thank you for the kind things you said about our relationship right back at you. I, I feel the same way about you. The Lord has put us together and I so cherish the relationship we have. I know of very few things I can think of in my mind where you and I disagree or differ. Mm -hmm. We, but, but, but that's okay. We don't have, but what I love about a relationship is we don't have to agree with every single thing that falls off each other's lips, but we love each other and we, we glean from each other's right. wisdom and insight. So thank you for all of that. You're very kind. And I agree with you. It's an, it's an amazing ministry relationship we have here, a Jew and a Gentile. Imagine that. <laughs> but anyway, no, back to your, what you were just teaching. Listen, I find that deeply fascinating, deeply uh, worthy of, of in-depth study. And let me just say this. Here's, here's my initial impression and reaction to everything you said. I think you're onto something here, brother. I think you're onto something monumental. Um, now, I, I can tell you, and you know this, but I'm going to speak to your the newer members of your audience because you're gaining people all the time and people who are newer in the Word of God because most of your audience knows what I'm getting ready to say, and you do too. And that is, whenever you delve into deep matters of theology, especially those matters that have been kind of hidden for whatever reason, uh, either a satanic blinder or either just ignorance or lack of interest on the part of humanity, but whenever we deal into those areas that are in the Bible, like you said, the seed of the woman, Hagar, and then we learn of this enmity between the seeds, you know, and, and I mean, that's there, but you, there's so little spoken of and written about it. But what is, you go on the internet and you can find anything, and then you get into what's called the serpent seed theology. Okay, okay, <clears throat> there is there is, excuse me, there are scriptures that speak of the seed of the serpent. I mean, you know, even Jesus called the, the religious elite that would wind up putting him on, on the cross. He said, you brood of vipers. Well, when you look down, when you look at those words, brood means family. 
It means children of. It means the seed of. Vipers, serpent, it's the same word. You seed of the serpent, you brood, you children of the serpent. I mean, Jesus called them that. John the Baptist called them that. Uh, so we, we hear, we find this theme from the Old Testament, as you, as you have beautifully pointed out, all the way to the New Testament. We find it all the way into the book of Revelation, where Satan in chapter 12 is looking to destroy the seed of God, if you will, the seed of heaven, the seed of the woman that has come to destroy him. So then, of course, we, we continue on into Revelation, and we find out that Satan himself, the dragon, gives power to the one that will eventually come. And so people say, well, that's his son, so to speak, his representation on the earth, his his, we call it the false Christ or the Antichrist, Satan's presenting him as the true Christ, the true Messiah, with his presence in him, with his power. There's the seed of the serpent manifest in human flesh. All right. But the problem is, I think, Rabbi Eric, and I think you'll agree with me on this, and of course, if you don't, I, I know we'll speak about it, but I think the problem is, is that we hear this serpent seed theology, serpent seed teaching so much, and what that does at its foundational level it's, it goes back and says something about Satan had sex with Eve, and then therefore there's half demons, half half devils, and half humans running around. And it gets really weird in places. Now, now, look, if we get to heaven and find out that that's exactly what happened in the garden, then I'll make my apologies. Right. But as you know in my book, Gods of Ground Zero, I examine what God says happened in the garden, what Jesus says happened in the garden, the, the Hebrew words, the Greek words, what Paul says, uh, what John says in the book of Revelation, and it's obvious that something deeply perverted happened in the garden. Something, I mean, the words are there that connect it, not necessarily to a sex act, but something that involved human sexuality. And as a matter of fact, when we look at the, the pr pronouncement of the curse that God put on Satan, where did the curse originate? From the womb of a woman, where the seed that would destroy him would come. So, so there's something deeply perverted, something deeply profane that happened in the garden that somehow was connected to maybe sexuality as we define it, the Bible doesn't say Satan had sex with the woman, but there's something to do with the seed, this understanding of the seed. It could be something along the lines of what we would call genetic altering or genetic mm -hmm. manipulation or gene splicing, a CRISPR-Cas9. See, we think, well, we discovered that. Well, who? where do we think we're getting that technology from? Right. We've eaten from the tree of fruit, of the fruit of good and evil, and, and so... So a lot of the perversion of technology is coming right from the demonic realm in these last days. Satan has been thrown down. He knows his time is short. He knows uh, uh, that the seed did crush him at Calvary and at the resurrection and at the ascension and at the birth of the church. He knows that the final crushing where, Eze where God tells Satan in Ezekiel 28, I will reduce you to ashes in those days and you will be no more. The kings of the earth will look upon you. They will stare, Isaiah 14, and they will say, is this the one? Is he the one that troubled the nations? Satan knows that day's on its way. So he's ramping up his efforts to seize control. Now, back to your original theological observation. Brother, I think you're on to something. I think somehow Satan, when he understood, as you have so brilliantly pointed out, and I've got a book coming out in the fall that I've asked you to give me some in input, and you have. You've also have been a part of writing a whole chapter in the new book on the rabbi, so you're, we're deeply involved in all this. But you, you so astutely pointed out that when Satan began his search, because in Genesis 3.15, God told him what was going to happen and why it was going to happen. These are your words, and I quote, and, and I credit you with these words in my book coming out. But he didn't, Satan didn't know when or exactly where or exactly who it was going to come, who it was going to manifest in, who this seed was. Where was this seed coming from exactly? Who was the seed? When exactly was this going to happen? And exactly where 
in the world or in the cosmos was this going to happen? Was it going to happen in the heavenly realms? Was it going to happen in the earthly realm? Well, he talked about a womb and a seed, so probably in the earthly realm. But there was a lot that Satan didn't know, so he had to start trying to figure it out. Now, we know Satan is not omnipresent. We know he's not omniscient. We know he's not omnipotent, these theological terms. He's not all-knowing. He's not ever-present like God is. He is not all-powerful. But he does work between the different dimensions. We know that. Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, the, the wickedness in the high places, the heavenly places. Jesus calls Satan this, the prince of the power of the air, indicating that there are, different, there are multiple dimensions wherein Satan has the key. Satan can transport through those. There are some where he cannot. He cannot just show up at the throne of God anytime he wants. I know some people would argue, well, in Job, it says he presented himself before the angels. But as you, I'm sure you know, the Hebrew language there indicates, no, he didn't just show up. He was summonsed. The angels were summonsed into the presence of God, and Satan was summonsed to be there and to give an account of what he had been doing. And it was at that summonsing where Satan probably was guarded by Michael and Gabriel when he walked through the entrance, <laughs> that God questioned him, where have you been? Okay, so the point I'm making here to answer your question is, because I think this is profound, that you this point you've made, is that in his quest to figure the, all of this stuff out, he finally hones in on the promise given to Abraham. Through your seed, not only does it say, will the whole earth be blessed, but there's a verse there, and I'm going to have to paraphrase it because I don't have it right in front of me, but there's a verse in that promise that says, and, and, and through that seed, every one of his enemies will be destroyed. His enemies. Whose enemies? The enemies of the seed. Well, who's the enemy of the seed? It's Satan. And so Satan heard that either personally or it was delivered back to him through his demonic emissaries or eventually the word came to him because, he, you know, Satan's not everywhere. He didn't, right. maybe, maybe he wasn't there when God spoke directly to Abraham, but Satan found out about it. Then he begins to attack the seed of Abraham and one of the ways he does it, I'm convinced he was probably involved in that whole Hagar thing. Well, there trying you, to there you go. So let me stop you there. Yeah. First of all, it was Sarai and Avram before they were Sarah and Abraham. That's, that's correct. God never acknowledged Hagar as Abraham's wife. Correct. So therefore, this conception was conceived in sin and not ordained by God. Correct. So therefore, that which is conceived in sin because this was usurping God's plan, uh, uh, Sarai took it upon herself to have her husband in sin uh, have relations with the Egyptian woman, Hagar. Correct. Faithlessness, so, so, disobedience. So he was not yet in his full covenant relationship with God. Two times he stumbled and fell third time he succeeded, but he was still in this period of time where he was doing the will of his wife, hearkening us back to the Garden of Eden, yes. where Adam did the will of his wife, and yes. we call that original sin. So we now go to a woman who is bearing a child that's conceived in sin, which is sin is of the devil, to a woman that God does not acknowledge as the wife, but only as the maidservant, therefore not even of the family of, right? And he proclaims that his name will be Ishmael and that he will be a wild, wild donkey among men, that all the nations of the world will war against him and he will war against his brothers. Yes. It's not until Abraham gets his new name the 13-year period of between the silent gap of the birth of Ishmael and the silent gap of 13 years when the visitation comes of God coming and telling Abraham that he's going to have a son, right? and Abraham serves him a meal, and that's when he makes this declaration. And then it's, then it's said, God makes this proclamation it says a year from now, and then it says, and then God spoke, and he went up. Okay, 
So now we're just left with the two angels, and those are the ones that went to Sodom. Yes. So we see that there was a name change. There was now a promise, okay? And we know that there was another prophecy added to this seed of Hagar that he was going to bring and be a vessel of enmity into the earth. And God Correct. never acknowledges her as a wife. So Correct. I'm trying to piece this together and saying, okay, Lord, you don't acknowledge her as a, as a wife. It is conceived in sin. You do not even acknowledge him as Abraham's son until 13 years later when Abraham speaks up and says, would that my son Ishmael be in your presence? God says, okay, I hear your cry. I will make him multiply and give him 12 kingdoms. And yes. so God acquiesces to the request of Abraham, but he does not negate the curse. Yes. So I, I, Ish yeah. Ishmael is conceived in sin, okay, the son of perdition, okay, the yes. son of the son of perdition, yes, conceived in sin to a woman who is an Egyptian, not acknowledged as a wife, now has her seed, and a woman doesn't have a seed, uh, only a man has a seed, but now we're talking about a generation, a lineage, right. a line, right. and this is an accursed line. And so we know that when we debate Jew and Gentile, that when we look at the Antichrist, the strongest evidence is it will be a Gentile, not a Jew, because who in the Jewish world is ever going to make a covenant with many in the secular, in the Christian, and in the Muslim world, that we believe it will be a Gentile, whether or not it's a Muslim or not, it would make more sense that it would come out of a Muslim or hybrid, like a Turkey kind of environment that's a little this, a little that, uh, than it would be somebody like a Netanyahu or uh, somebody like a uh, Barack Obama, uh, but somebody in that world that could speak the languages of all and find that common ground to make a covenant with many. Yes, and so yes. I just wonder, and I haven't seen dialogue. And so, you know, I did the searches and so I came to you and I said, you know, I'm teaching this and I'm stopping in my tracks and saying, God speaks to her seed. He acknowledges that she's not his wife. His name hasn't been changed yet, so is there yet even a Jewish lineage until his name has been changed, until the promise is given through the promised seed, the one who was conceived to pass through the cut. That's why Ishmael was conceived. There was no circumcision, no cut, no covenant, uh, and 13 years later uh, now calls for the circumcision and Abraham circ has, to, uh, has to circumcise himself. He has to circumcise his 13-year-old son and God has been silent for 13 years letting all this fester um, and sending her back, uh, Hagar the Egyptian, back um, into a situation that is only going to breed more contempt. If my mother has contempt for the people and jealous of Sarah and jealous of the promised seed, then how much enmity, going back to the 315 reference, yes. how much enmity is inbred in yes. this DNA of one who's a wild donkey, a wild yes. ass of a man. And well, so it, it's just, it's just, it just hit me like where has this dialogue ever occurred before and who's yes. talking about this as a relevant starting point for uh, if we can trace the seed of the woman, why are we having so much trouble or why do we just throw up our hands and say and make up a story because you and I know the commentators. Uh, those are ordinary potatoes. You'll probably yes. have some on Thursday. Yes. Uh, but if we look at the scripture, God doesn't drop us these hints and these, this 
this bait uh, <laughs> and throw it out to us and say, you know, just playing with you, yeah. just toying with you. No, they're there for a reason. You know, I'm giving you something, and and this is what triggers in you. This is where you and I are very much the same, is that we'll latch on to something and say, okay, I don't care that nobody's talking about it. Right. That's my call to talk That's about right. it. And where is it birthed? It's birthed in these dialogues. And then yes. all of a sudden, it pops out the other end as, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> a, 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 as, a, as a book. I, You're right. And you know, Rabbi Eric, listen, I, 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 I love this. Thank you for having me. I don't know if any... I feel like you and I are just sitting at a table with a cup of coffee talking. I forget that there are many, many people out there listening to us. But, <laughs> but listen, I, I listen. You're on to something, brother. It, in my humble opinion, and this is what I'm saying, and what we're saying together is that somehow Satan, he's not God, and he's not nearly as smart as God. But, but God says that he was the most most brilliant and the most beautiful of anything he's ever made. So he's at the top of the food chain as far as all of God's created creatures, which means he's way smarter than we are, which means Satan knew about genetic editing and CRISPR-Cas9 and DNA and, 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 and somehow the sins of the fathers will go through tens of generations unless there's a cut in there somewhere. Satan knew all that from the beginning. I, and so when you come to this whole thing of Sarah and her seed and the lineage and the generation and the enmity between God's people and, and the Gentile world, and particularly the Arab world, and most particularly the Muslim world, we're watching it flesh out before our eyes. My goodness, Rabbi, you're, you're on to something here. Now, how that all occurred, I don't know. People want to say, well, Satan had sex with somebody. I I, you know, the Bible doesn't say that, but it does say that he is working through the biological processes of humankind. He's fascinated by that. Listen, I, this is going to sound like I'm, I'm shifting gears, but I'm not. Hang on. Um, we, we both have talked about UFO uh, phenomena and being taken and, you know, and, and all of that. And, and, and we both believe that's of the demonic realm. It's interdimensional. It's not little green men from Mars. It's Satan in the last days. We understand that. But look, brother, what is it that people who have been, who have claimed to have been taken, what is it that they almost all talk about that they get examination of their sexual organs? Am I right? I mean, there's Always. something about that demonic realm that is thoroughly infatuated with this creation that God did. It started in the garden with Adam and Eve, and perhaps that was the profanity. Perhaps Satan was deeply involved in some kind of examination or something that he talked him into. Who knows? Who knows? Something happened that God said, I'm going to kill you for this. And he held Adam and Eve accountable because they succumbed to him when God said, don't do it. Don't even touch the fruit of this tree. Don't even mess with that. But they did it anyway. So when we come to Hagar and we watch this seed break off, we, we know just a little bit that we know in our human uh, scientific knowledge, there's something extremely mysterious about this coded language of DNA and the genome, the human genome. We know that the Bible declared thousands of years ago that, that sin and specific sin can be passed down generationally. God says that. He says, I will put these curses upon your children and your children's children. If, if you have no other gods before me, and if you do, then this, this curse will follow through the generations. So I'm just saying, please forgive me. I'm just thinking out loud as you and I are talking, but I'm thinking about what you're saying, and I'm thinking, my brother, I, I think you've hit upon something monumental that's not being talked about much. I think that something Satan was doing, something perverse and something to, to skew the, the coming judgment upon him through the seed of Hagar, uh, I, I think there was something demonic, some kind of manipulation with the with the generations that would follow, and 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 I'm 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 agreeing with you, brother. I don't know to 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 what depth you have taken it from there, but you're absolutely right. There's the seed that God promised through which our Messiah would come, our Savior. And think about this now. I examined this a little bit in my book, Gods and Thrones. 
You think about how the angel Gabriel came to Mary. Well, nobody even dreams that Gabriel had sex with Mary. Right. Or that the, and he says, and the Holy Spirit will implant this seed. Nobody believes that the Holy Spirit had sex with Mary. But what he was saying is that God has the power from his throne to speak something into existence. We know that from Genesis 1. And he's going to speak from his throne's power into the womb of the woman. And through that seed connecting with humanity will come God himself in the flesh, the unique son of God, the one and only time God would ever come to the world like this for this purpose. Okay. You know, you know I, cover, I cover that entire um, section in my chapter on seeds in the seven laws of abundant living lessons yes. learned from the tree of life. And talk about the catalyst and talk about the Methuselah seed and talk yes. about a seed surviving for 2,000 years laying dormant, which gives us forensic evidence that a seed can lay dormant and be yes. passed on and still come to fruition. We're talking with Carl Gallup's author of his latest book, Gods of Ground Zero, The Truth of Eden's Iniquity, Why It Still Matters, and the Mystery Surrounding What's Coming Next. We're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we're going to continue in this freestyle edition of the Carl Gallup's Hour, and we're going to talk about this Garden of Eden. We're going to talk about some things from the book, uh, Gods of Ground Zero, about Eden and why all of this prophecy that took place and all the separation that took place is going to be reunified in the Garden of Eden to come, Gan Eden, Paradise, if you didn't know that's what it was called, and that's where Jesus said that he would be with the thief on the cross. Today, yes. I will be with you in Gan Eden, Gan Eden Paradise. We'll be right back. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and I've got a question for you. What do you think they're doing with your DNA? Oh, you know that 23andMe kit that you sent off, and you got back that report that told you you were Irish, you were French, you were Jewish? Wonder who's interested in that information? It's not like you've sent it off to a database with millions of other people and they can steal your identity. And who would really be interested in that information other than you? Well, maybe your friends and family. But there's one, yes, one, who is so interested in your DNA that it would be something that would make you afraid. And that is Satan himself. Why would Satan be interested in your DNA? Because there is a Y chromosome marker that determines whether or not you are in the line of Aaron. That's right, the biblical line of Aaron the priest. That's because if the priesthood comes back and the high priest takes his role as the head of the Sanhedrin, they will be the ones to call for the return of Jesus. Well, what can they do with your DNA? Well, there are 40-plus countries weaponizing DNA today. And imagine if Satan could weaponize your DNA and use that Y chromosome market to take out the line of the high priest, then Jesus doesn't come back. That is the plot behind the best-selling book, The Codus, now out in second edition, on Kindle, $2.99, also available in paperback. This is a biblical thriller beyond comparison that's going to take you on an incredible journey to understand what they could do with your DNA. I also want to encourage you to visit our website, ignitingandnation.com, and click on Special Offers. There you're going to find the yellow cover of this book, The Seven Laws of Abundant Living, Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life. We're going to take you on a journey in the Garden of Eden to the seed, the ground, all the way out to the fruit that reveals things of the natural that God is trying to reveal supernatural truths. Contained within these pages are seven laws and seven lessons within each law. They're going to take you on an incredible journey of understanding about the life you live and the fruit you bear. I want to encourage you to click on that yellow cover. We're going to ask for your email. Now, we won't send you spam because spam is not kosher, but we will send you the first chapter of this book. I want to encourage you to get Seven Laws of Abundant Living Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on Barnes & Noble. You can get it Books A Million, wherever great Christian books are sold. Take this journey with me to the Tree of Life in the Garden of Eden and to the Tree of Life we see again at the River of Life. Get your copy today. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Carl Gallup's author of Gods of Ground Zero, 
the truth of Eden's iniquity, while it's, why it still matters, and the mystery surrounding what's coming next. Carl, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Rabbi Eric. It's great to be with you. I'm, I'm enjoying our, as you call it, our freestyle discussion. Freestyle I'm, I'm discussion. It. But I want to kind of rein it back in. I've kind of okay. thrown this, this um, um, mind-bending concept out there. <laughs> and um, um, You've got me thinking. You know, got you thinking and uh, good fodder for future conversations. Uh, yes. But in Gods of Ground Zero, and I want to talk about this, uh, you talk about the mystery of what's coming next. And, uh, you know, the whole topic of the Garden of Eden, uh, it's the very foundation of the book I wrote, The Seven Laws of Abundant Living, is that if the Garden of Eden was so important to God that we would get kicked out of it, why do we never talk about the Garden of Eden? Thank you. Yeah, why, that's why, why I wrote that why, book. Why, why, yeah, and, and it's why I yep. wrote my book is because we see the tree of life and yep. we see the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We see the tree of life again where Jesus says, I reserve the right for the overcomer to sit at my right hand and eat from the tree of life. Which is in paradise. In, in paradise. other words, it's never left. Never Jesus left. said, which is in paradise. Not will be, not used to be, which is in paradise. You're absolutely right. So let me make my, my famous statement that um, is going to make 75 million people really mad. Okay. Uh, that you and I both know that this is not your best life now. This is your worst, worst life now. Thank you. Thank you. I said that yesterday on an interview with somebody. I said the same thing. This is your worst life now. If this is your yeah. best life now, I feel bad for you. Yes, me too. Because for you, this is the only heaven you're going to ever know. For That's me it. and for Carl Gallops, it's the only hell we're ever going to know. And for That's our it. friend Zev Perot and for for Joe Horn and for Tom Horn and for Josh Peck and Derek Gilbert and Mike Heiser and, and all of our good friends, this is the only hell we're going to ever know. But it also is an opportunity for us to walk along the way and see where the way is going. Yes. And Jeremiah gave us an incredible, stunning uh, instruction. He said, when you come to the crossroads... Choose the ancient path, and there you will find your peace. Yes. And that ancient path always leads back to the walk along the way, uh, the people of the way. Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. So if we are going to return to the Father, we have to walk along the way through Jesus. And where is the Father? Right? The Father is... And it's interesting because someone posted uh, the question, where in the Bible does it say when you die, you go to heaven? Yeah. And I thought are, about are you, that. Are you asking me or are you just right, making the right. statement? No, th that was the question they asked. Where is the scripture that says when you die, you go to heaven? Yeah. It says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Yes. Okay. What scripture says when you die, you go to heaven? Right. So if the Lord hasn't moved and he was in the Garden of Eden, when did he relocate? Right. Yeah. Has he relocated? Are you asking me? I'm asking you. Oh, okay. See, see, you yeah. have the typical Jewish mindset right. of asking questions all the time, and right. a lot of times you don't mean for anybody to answer them. <laughs> Well, well, I tease my good friend yeah, Zev yeah, Barat all the but time. You, right, you've been spending a lot of time with Zev, so you're starting to understand how we operate. Yes, I do. Right. So I could never tell when you're directing a question right. to me or yeah, you're making yeah, right, a statement right, right, with a question right, mark on the end right. of it. Right. This is a statement with a question mark at the end. Okay. okay. So you can talk. Uh, does the Bible document God's relocation? And does the Bible say when we die we go to heaven, or does it say to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Where is the Lord located right now? Question mark. To me. To you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, well, here's my best understanding of it. Listen, you're right in, in the way you're setting it up with the questions. Um, and so I don't know of a verse that says, and when you die, you will go to heaven. Um, however... 
that's the whole message of God's word. But you got to, but 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 folks have to understand what is heaven. It's where it's where God is. It's his it's his domain. It's it's his presence. It's at his throne. So we discover in the earliest pages of Scripture. Well, where would heaven have been? It, it, well, where God set up his throne on earth, this beautiful creation he made in this dimension. God doesn't live in the universe. God's not of the universe. The universe is not God, and God's not the universe. He exists outside of the universe. This is one of his dimensions, his creation. But he comes into the universe, sets up his throne, sets up his fellowship with the divine realm and the earthly realm. All of that was was spit upon by Satan and ultimately Adam and Eve. The divine veil dropped, but his presence never left. The whole book of Hebrews tells us four or five times that everything, for example, that's in Jerusalem and on the Temple Mount and the Temple, behind the veil, just behind the veil, is the reality. But what we're seeing on the earth is the copy. It's a shadow of that which is behind the veil. So when we come to the New Testament, we find that we're promised eternal life through Jesus Christ. We're promised that at the end of all things, our divine nature will be restored. Peter says that, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. We're, we're, we, are, we are promised that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so then when Jesus was on the cross and that one thief looked at him and said, Lord, and if you translated that in Hebrew, more than likely it would say Yahweh, or at least Adonai. In other words, he's attesting, I know who you are. You are the Messiah. You are God in the flesh. You are you are the Son of God. He says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. All right. Now, who is Jesus? God in the flesh. Where was he going? To paradise. Where And, and who was going with him? The thief. Why? Because he was getting ready to leave this earthly dimension and walk through a portal into the next dimension that's behind the veil that Hebrews talks about. Where? To where God is, to where Jesus is in all of his glory. Now, you know this, brother. Not only did you know it long before I wrote the book, but you know where I'm going because you know what I've got in the book. But I want to make sure our audience knows this. In the New Testament, the word paradise is used three times. Only three times. How, there is a fourth. There's a synonym, the bosom of Abraham in Luke chapter 16, when Jesus talks about the rich man uh, and, and, and Lazarus. The rich man dies and goes to hell or prison. He's waiting for the great white throne of judgment. And there he's in torment and thirst. The, the, the Lazarus dies and he goes to the bosom of Abraham. Okay, and, and anybody that would look that up would know that that's a Hebrew expression for it's synonymous with Gan Eden, Gan Eden, or, or, and those are the Hebrew words that translate literally to English as Garden of Eden, or the synonym in the Greek that translates to the English word paradise. So bosom of Abraham, Garden of Eden, and paradise, they are equivalent. They are synonyms for each other. All of the Hebrew dictionaries, all of the Greek dictionaries bear this out. They do. All of the lexicons say what I'm saying. I didn't make this up. You and I aren't making this up. So when you come to the New Testament, you hear Paul talking about, I know a man who was caught up to paradise, caught up to the throne of God, caught up to the third heaven. See, Paul makes paradise synonymous with heaven, and so he says, I was caught up there. I know what I'm talking about. All right. Um, uh, we, we find um, in, in, in Revelation chapter 2 where Jesus says, and to he who overcomes, I will give the right to eat of the tree of life, which is in paradise. It is in, not was in, not will be in. It's there. It's always been there. Well, where was the tree of life? Genesis 3 says, Gan Eden. All right, Jesus says, where's the tree of life? Paradise, all right, the Garden of Eden. But by the time we get to Revelation chapter 21 and 22, we discover that the Garden of Eden is being restored. 
and it's called the New Jerusalem. The veil is lifted. The dimensional portal is opened. We, we now leave behind this earthly corruption, and we walk back into the Garden of Eden that has been guarded and veiled and shielded all of these millennial. And then the Re Revelation chapter 22 says, what's there? It says the throne of God is there. The throne of the Lamb is there. Uh, the river of life flows th from the throne. And on each side of the river of life, the, it, the tree of life is there. Well, where has the tree of life always been? Garden of Eden. So all of this stuff is synonymous. Paradise, Garden of Eden. Paul says, I've been there. I know what's there. Your mind cannot conceive. Your eye has never seen. The ear has never heard. And all I know is I want to be absent from the body so that I can be present with the Lord again. John was caught up to the throne room. He was caught up to paradise. Jesus told the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in Gan Eden. He says, it, in the English, it says paradise. It comes from the Greek word paradisio, but it is synonymous with God to Eden. And that thief, if he was a Jew, and more than likely he was, he heard Jesus say, today you will be with me in the Garden of Eden. Today. So, so brother, yes, we are promised when we pass through this veil, what we call death, when we leave this earthly dimension, this corrupted, uh, degenerated, degenerative uh, earthly dimension, we will immediately, if we're under the blood of Jesus, we immediately pass through like the thief into the Garden of Eden. And then Revelation 22, as I said, the very last words of the Bible talk about how God is going to restore it all on the face of the earth, and those that know him and love him and are under the blood of his Son, those that have overcome, they will now have their divine nature restored to them, as Adam and Eve had from the beginning. They will dwell again with God in paradise, or the bosom of Abraham, or Gan Eden, or the Garden of Eden, where the throne of God is, where the river of life is, where the tree of life is, and then it says, we will rule and reign with him forever, which means he's going to do some more stuff. <laughs> He's going to do some more stuff in the future, and we get to do it with him. He may start his creation process all over again. He may create other universes or other galaxies or other planets, and we get to be a part of it with him. And you seldom hear any of that preached. All we hear is come down, get baptized, join our church, shake the preacher's hand, give some money, and we'll pronounce you a ticket to heaven. And, 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 and that's not what it's about. Paul says, don't you know we will judge angels? Don't you know we will judge the nations? Don't you know Satan will be burned down before us? We will judge him. Don't you know we will rule and reign in the ages to come? From where? From the Garden of Eden is what the Bible says. Exactly the place in which we are ultimately confirmed in our holiness. This yes. is something so extraordinary that we see the process for Isaiah, who was prophesying on his own for five chapters. Sixth chapter, he comes yeah. to the presence <laughs> of God. He finds out that, it, whoops, I've been operating in my own strength. Now I'm a man of unclean lips. And God says now, once he takes and he burns him, now he's confirming him in his ability to now be an adequate spokesman for God. He says, who should I send? We know that the angels that did not fall with, with uh, Satan right, are now confirmed in their holiness, and we get equal status to them because Correct. we have the same fate as the angels because the angels will be with, they are in spirit, so we're in this glorified body, and we are confirmed in our holiness. There won't, we will be without the ability to sin because we're now in this beautiful picture of what God has redeemed, which was a place where sin could occur. Now in the new Gan Eden, in the new Garden of Eden, God is creating, because this is after judgment, yes. after reconciliation, after redemption, after final resolution, after destruction of evil, Evil is defeated. The minions, the demons, those who follow the Antichrist, all have now suffered their fate. The remainder are confirmed in their holiness so that for eternity can rule and reign with the, with the Messiah, with God. And it says even at that time that, this, that everything is under the authority of God and including the Son who is subject to the Father. And so we now see truly the hierarchy of heaven 
that although that God and the Son are one, when it's sitting at the right hand of the Father interceding, that they are separate but equal in this picture. And we then become joined to that, together with them in our holiness. And this is just such a powerful, that this is the journey that we're on, is towards this command that says, God says, be holy because I am holiness. I'm holy. I right. cannot obtain that, but I can press on to that yes, because I know the promise is, is if I walk this way and I follow in the footsteps of my Messiah, that I ultimately will be able to stand before the Lord on that judgment day and give accountability. And the only words that can part my lips is Yeshua HaMashiach. That's there it. is nothing else I can say that's going to get me in. But once right. I say those words that I, put, I believe in my heart and profess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, I am then in and glorified, confirmed in my holiness. My judgment is over. I, the wrath of God comes nowhere near me. And now I am now enjoying what is not the promise of death where people say, oh, now Aunt Sylvia is walking the streets of gold and the walls are jasper. No, that's the new heaven and the new earth. That is not what happens when somebody dies. And I've heard that falsehood preached at so many funerals, and I'm sure you have too. Yes, yes, I have. And it's yes. not what the Bible describes. No, yeah. So, and there's even, this, there's even this beginning of an interdimensional relationship as soon as we are under the blood of Jesus, because the Bible says that at that moment, we are then seated with Christ in the heavenlies. And I know, well, I don't know. We don't know. I mean, God's interdimensional. There's no telling what that means in its fullness. <laughs> we, we, we say, well, he means spiritually. He means metaphorically. Well, I think it's deeper than metaphorically. But at the same time, I know that consciously we are here in this body in this flesh on this earth but we are now children of god we are now declared righteous because of the blood of jesus and now we are ambassadors of his coming kingdom that's why we're here we're of in this earth but not of this earth we are in this world but not of this world and so it's just amazing how the bible speaks of these interdimensional relationships that begin in the, the body itself, the spirit, the mind, the soul, and then in ultimate reality. I mean, if I, I, th these are the kinds of things that the church needs to hear. Not you can have your best life now and, and you know, and, and, you know, give money to my ministry and God will make you. That's not what this is about. This is about the restitution of all things. It's about a cosmic war. It's about reclaiming what is rightfully God's that Satan stole from him, trashed it, the Garden of Eden. The whole Bible is about the reclama reclamation, the reclaiming of the Garden of Eden and humanity that will willingly submit to God's plan of salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth. The whole biblical message is about the restoration of the Garden of Eden and us being a part of it. Amen. Amen. It is a promise that is that hope. You know, and says in Peter, is it First uh, or Second Peter 3.15, uh, give a ready answer for the hope that burns within you. And yes. the hope is always something that's in the future. It's never in the past. And our hope is not in what happened 2,000 years ago. It's the hope in the return of Messiah, the defeat of the, Antichrist, of the Antichrist, the defeat of Satan, and the ability to rule and reign by Messiah's side. And that you and I know that this, our relationship is not temporal. Our relationship is eternal. And Amen. the beauty is we get to make the best of our life together now in this setting because we know a better life is coming for us in the next setting, and uh, it is a beautiful picture. We've been talking with Carl Gallup's author of Gods of Ground Zero, The Truth of Eden's Iniquity, Why It Still Matters, and the Mystery Surrounding What's Coming Next. If you have the questions that we have about the Garden of Eden, about what was, what is, and what is to come, then many of those questions are answered for you within these pages. And if you are not a Carl Gallup's reader, and you want to start somewhere, what a great book to start with. Thank you. What a great book to start with to get to know the heart of a man who hungers and thirsts for God's truth in the Hebrew, in the Greek, 
and what's contained in the text of Scripture. Biblical truth. Not hearsay, biblical truth. Yes, we draw on references to external sources of opinions, but then we go right back to here's what God says. There's only one authority, and that is the authority that he and I both acknowledge, and that is the author of this one book. And if you want the supernatural, there's nothing more supernatural than what's contained in these pages. Carl Gallus, we wish you and your family a wonderful and happy and healthy Thanksgiving and look forward to seeing you back here on your regular appointed time and date, uh, which will be December the 10th at 12 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time for the next edition of the Carl Gallup's Hour. Until we see you then, we bid you shalom, my friend. Thank you, Rabbi Eric. God bless you. God bless shalom you. to you as well. Thank you. We're going to take a short break, and when we return, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.